Good morning on this 18th Sunday after Trinity. The theme for this morning service is the Great Commandment. I start with the watchword from 1 John 4 verse 21. He has given us this command, whoever loves God must also love his brother. We had our church committee meeting this week and just some important information we want to share with you. We spoke about the importance of looking after yourself spiritually. And I think this is something that not only people in leadership should do, but everyone should do. And this is also actually part of what we hear in our service today. We spoke about a joint service with the Cryfontaine congregation, which we will be having. This will be on the second Sunday of Advent. So more information is to come regarding that. The children's room is looking good. It's been painted and it's um, coming along very nicely. We thank Christiana for this. Please feel free to, to see uh, how it looks on a Sunday morning. We are looking for new lectors to come and read on Sunday mornings. So if you want to be part of our services on a Sunday morning, please feel free to let me know and we can add you to our roster. We have decided to have our men's breakfast this year on the 5th of November, the morning of Saturday 5 November at Kapsig. More information also to follow regarding the time. And our other announcements is that the Bible study and the prayer groups continue as usual and you are more than welcome to join. Just let me know and I will give you the necessary information. Let us start the service by praying together. Lord, we thank you that we as a congregation, even though we watch over the internet, even though we are not physically with each other, that we can stand together, Lord. We know that the church is not the building, but the people that gather in your name, the body of Christ. Help us, Lord, to stand together as your body in this world so that others could see in us something of your love, something of your grace, something of your fellowship. Lord, guide us in this week and let this word strengthen us so that we can be joyful as we follow your wonderful way. Amen. Let us confess our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty from where he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Our sermon text this morning is from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 to 20. I read from the ESV translation. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. But be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our theme this week is the Great Commandment. And this already brings with it some expectation. Commandments remind us of the Old Testament's commandments, which was given to guide Israel and how they should live. Many laws were given, and with time some of these laws came to be more important than others. Especially ten commandments. Ten laws that would help and guide Israel to live in a good relationship with each other and with God. In the New Testament, we hear that these laws were broken down even further to the two most important laws, to love God and to love your neighbor. Love being the crucial element in this law or command. Another thing that comes to mind when one speaks about laws is that the, what is the reward for keeping these laws? Or in the Jewish Christian world, what would lead to eternal life? If I keep the commandments, can I earn my salvation? And the story of the rich young man from Mark 10 comes to mind. He said that he did everything that was commanded of him. 
Jesus said what he still needed was to sell all he had and give his money to the poor, and then to follow Jesus. A radical statement in a world where following the rules could lead to this reward or this salvation. So we have love in the one hand, and in the other hand, the willingness to give up something. And our text this morning from Ephesians doesn't speak on either one of these. So why does our text with the theme of the great commandment come up? What does love for God and your neighbor and the willingness to give up something have in common? It is different. It is different than the world was back then and different than the world is today. To be honest, if one compares the world back then and its issues with the world today, you'll find out that it's actually very similar. But the great commandment to love God and to love your neighbor and this willingness to give up something is the commandment to be different than this world with all its issues. This is where the text from Ephesians is applicable. Because in this text, Paul is calling the Ephesians to live differently, to be different than the society they live in. In the previous verses of chapter 5, Paul speaks about light and darkness to describe the contrast between the world and the church of the day. In our pericope, he uses wise and unwise, or we can say foolish, to be wise instead of unwise. Wise in the Old Testament was to live according to God's will and follow the rules God put in place. Unwise would be to turn away from God and to rely on yourself and on the things of this world. To be wise in the church would be to place your trust in God rather than in this world by living a life that is different. By living a life according to the will of the Lord. The heart of wisdom here is the understanding of the Lord's will. A wise life follows the determined direction of our Lord. In verse 16, where it says to make the best of the time, it says in the Greek to buy out time. Use your time well, and instead of postponing, and instead of first doing something else, instead of thinking later on you will do this and that, use your time now already differently. Already now live for the will of the Lord. And importantly, to live in a society. He is not telling the people to isolate themselves and to go live a holy life somewhere far off. Some did that, but that was not the church's calling. We live in this world. And that means that we can be influenced by this world, but also we can influence it. It is wise for us to place our trust in the right thing in this world where we live. And that thing is the will of the Lord. So the first encouragement is for the congregation to live wisely and not to waste time and to be idle, but to make the most of the opportunities to do good, so to also counteract the evil days they live in. The second encouragement continues with the, with the contrast of the first, but the readers are now told not to be foolish, that they should gain practical insight into what the Lord requires which leads to the third encouragement to not get drunk, but rather be filled with the Spirit. In a way, this is just a variation of the same theme, as drunkenness was associated with foolishness, and the Spirit is the mediator of wisdom. Earlier in the Ephesians letter, Paul already uses this idea of being filled. In chapter 3, verse 19, he speaks of the fullness of God. And in chapter 1, verse 23, church as the fullness of Christ. The Spirit is here regarded in the same light as God and Christ and stands in the middle of our passage because it links wisdom to worship. The joyful celebration that is to characterize the life of believers will not come in a large amount of wine, but with the continual openness to the influence of the Spirit. The Spirit-filled living will manifest itself in the communal worship as they address and educate one another by means of all types of songs that is Spirit-inspired, as they sing their praise to Christ from the heart, and as they, in Christ's name, offer thanksgiving to their God the Father for all the blessings that He has bestowed upon them. Songs were used in various ways in the Old and New Testament. We know psalms were used to praise God both individually and communally. Hymns could have had in some educational function being sung as part of the liturgy of a service. Songs that they would sing every time they get together to remind each other of what 
they believe as believers, of what bind them together, of what Christ has done for them. Spiritual songs and songs of thanksgiving would then be written by members of the congregation, wherein they enjoy singing songs to God, worshipping our Lord together. The focus of the passage still remains on believers and the conduct that is required of them. If they are to be different from the surrounding society, this conduct can be summed up in terms of a wise living that perceives the times and the Lord's will, an openness to the power of the Spirit and a participation in communal worship that is full of song, praise and thanksgiving. To be filled with the Spirit is not some private mystical experience you have, but to be part of the communal worship and relationships with inside the church or the body of Christ. This communal support within the congregation, within a society, would be crucially important to strengthen the congregation, to strengthen them on their way. And in this wonderful way, the Spirit is intimately involved within the congregation. It binds the congregation together as they stand strong, stand together to support each other, and also in worship, praise and give thanks to God. Paul is bringing the whole of the Trinity into the congregation's thoughts here. Christ's divine status is implicit. He is the Lord whose world the community is to understand in verse 17. And to Him worship is directed in verse 19. Yet Christ is also the mediator between God the Father and the believers, as a thanksgiving is offered in His name to the one who is the ultimate source of all goodness and salvation in verse 20. And also centrally to our text is the Spirit's mediation of the divine power and presence. It is the Spirit who produces the wisdom and understanding called for in the first two encouragements. And it's the Spirit who initiates and provides the worship elaborated on in the third. So much so that the various songs believers sing are called spiritual. No wonder the central call of this passage is for believers to be continually filled with the Spirit, the motivating force for their distinctive life of wise conduct and glad worship. To connect this text to the theme of the Great Commandment is to remind the Church to live a life that is different from this world. The Church can also be groups of believers outside the building, but the communal emphasis is very important here. Christians are not called to, be, to love God somewhere in a corner, disconnected from the world, but to love God and their neighbor as part of this world with all its issues. Being part of the body of Christ is also to be willing to give up something of yourself as you give yourself to God, as God has given himself to this world in Christ. To help us be different from the world, we need the wisdom of the Spirit to see the direction of the Lord's will for us. In prayer, ask the Spirit to help us to read the times as the prophets of the Old Testament read the times and to act accordingly. What is God up to and how are we to play our role now and not later? To be different is to enjoy life in worship and praise, to give thanks not to the world but give thanks to God from where all salvation comes. Give thanks for Christ's life, death and resurrection. Give thanks to the Spirit for our brothers and sisters in faith, standing together and to build each other in love. Support each other in love. Teach each other in love. And in the wisdom of the Spirit, enjoy each other as we give ourselves to God in Christ. Amen. Let us share the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And let us not fall into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power, and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. The love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit is with you today, and every day to live differently and wisely. Amen. Mm -hmm.